Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for another AppSAD Insight webinar. My name is Jim Hunter. I'm one of the NERF educators here at Insight. Um, and I think you're in for a good presentation today. Um, certainly one that I'm looking forward to. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we're meeting today. And I'd like to extend a welcome and respect to elders past, present and emerging, and extend that welcome and respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders that might be joining us out there in webinar land. So thank you and welcome. As I said, I think it's going to be an interesting one. It's around the topic of trauma and particularly looking at uh, its relationship with men and how we might deal with it and where we might go for support. Um, but more than that, it's being delivered by somebody that actually I've had the pleasure of working with for the last year or so. Um, it's James Hoey, who's a clinical psychologist and is one of the educators here at Insight. Um, and I think you will, uh, like me, be impressed with not only his approach, but also his knowledge around subjects such as this. So without any further ado, I'm gonna hand over to James Hoey, who's going to present on trauma. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining out there in webinar land. And thank you for that introduction, uh, Jim. I'm just going to uh, also add my acknowledgement to traditional owners on the lands and waters that we meet, and also acknowledge those with lived experience and their carers for uh, the opportunities that they give and share with us on a daily basis. And I think I often say in the trainings I deliver or any time that I'm talking to a group of my colleagues like I am today, that I really feel that I'm only competent or have anything to add because of the uh, privilege I've had and the honor to journey alongside people. Um, in this case, many men, their families, their loved ones, their communities in their journeys of healing and change. And from that, had a lot of opportunity to, to learn, to be corrected, and to uh, hopefully be able to do things better. So our topic today is about bringing, bringing trauma-informed care to working with men. And some of the symbolism, symbolism in this particular title slide might be a standout for those who also work in this area, but we will come back to it but I'd like to also acknowledge that with this topic, we are in the month of November. Uh, I'm certainly a supporter, hence the slide uh, that you see there. I've not actually attempted to grow a moustache this year or really any previous year since I was very young because no one needs to see that. But I'm feeling very supported today by the fact that I'm in this room with uh, two great men, uh, Niall and Jim, who are both... Uh, doing very well in that department. So um, I probably just a little bit of a um, bit of a, a correction there. I am a common garden variety psychologist, not, not a clinical psychologist, but thank you, Jim. Um, and um, I also say that in, in terms of that common garden variety tag that I'm not coming here today as a expert clinician in this field or as a known researcher but as a very, very interested clinician as a result of the journey that uh, I've been on in my work professionally, most importantly. And I'm wanting to share some of that journey with you today in a practical conversation around, okay, what have I found that works? What have uh, I been told by men? What have I learned from a bit of a deep dive into this area? Mainly because I've had to. I also want to sort of uh, frame this up as well with another uh, couple of caveats. And one of them is about, we're gonna be talking today in a bit of a gender binary, obviously about predominantly about men and even probably even more narrowly in terms of traditional masculinity and the way that that helps or hinders uh, men's recovery journey. But I'm fully aware that there's a greater diversity that exists. Um, and even a greater diversity within the concept of masculinity that exists. So just wanted to uh, put that out there that it's uh, not uh, trying to in any way be uh, sort of too narrowly focused, um, but in some ways, just uh, speaking about uh, the binary in that regard. It's also today not about um, who, who uh, in terms of the area of support, 
are not trying to set up to, in any opposition about what's more important or what groups or what genders are more important. It's more about, I think we need to recognise that trauma impacts widely uh, and also that there's, there's not enough resources, whichever way you look. So this is about just adding to the conversation. And uh, also acknowledging that trauma is a very wide definition that really to me, and, and I'll talk a little bit about how I talk about trauma with men as we go through this morning, but they are events which are wide and broad that can be often very defining, life-changing um, as moments that can, or as a collection of moments that can shape or define a person's view about themselves. And, uh, you know, regardless of whether a person goes on to develop a trauma-related uh, disorder or condition or anything like that. So trying to keep the, uh, the definition broad in that regard. So I mentioned before the journey that I've been on, which has kind of been a parallel thing about my own professional journey as along with working in the AOD field and sector for a number of decades. Uh, I'm not sure if it was by design or by intent, but my work focus has always predominantly been in male dominated areas. That's uh, historically working in uh, uh, health focused programs that support people in the criminal justice system, as well as also serving for a period of time um, as a psychology officer with the Australian Army in, in a reserve capacity, but working with uh, a range of units and regiments in that, in that, in that way. Um, so that's kind of really led me to kind of working in a lot of areas uh, with men. And without too much time under my belt, I really started to see the strong links between uh, alcohol uh, and drugs um, and issues of events and experiences that have been adverse to people and how the two either went together, uh, there's all different hypotheses, how they kind of connect, but the the relationship was very, very strong. Also, as part of my uh, work with the, uh, as a regimental psychologist, was to do briefings every year to the whole, um, the whole sort of uh, regiment around uh, topics about mental health, suicide awareness and prevention. And probably a little bit embarrassingly in, this is the late 2000s, it's when I first started seeing the suicide stats that kind of reflected the, the fact that of completed suicides, uh, three quarters were male. And that uh, sent me off again on another little bit of a deep dive in this area. And hence, all these things coming together to kind of start to focus on what's the, what's, I need to get better in this area, I need to work better. And a bit of a shout out at the moment around that. Uh, I know we're not talking about suicide today, but uh, because it is Movember, just a shout out to the Queensland Mental Health Commission who in their current uh, iteration of the suicide plan, Every Life, uh, 2019 to 2029, really identify uh, action items against uh, men as a vulnerable population in this area. And I look forward to uh, the implementation of those action items and some of the research that's pending as a result of that. And then in uh, 2011 was when I first heard about the trauma-informed care approach. Uh, I was at a conference in Washington, uh, National Association of Drug Court Professionals Conference, and I was sitting next to a manager from the uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, and, and it, was a, it was a big flavor. It was, in that, uh, it was in that conference everywhere, mainly because at the time SAMHSA had made it a part of their funding contracts that people had to be able to demonstrate trauma-informed care. So it was the first time I heard about it and I probably didn't really understand it at that point because the way I interpreted it, it was about um, uh, needing to have care workers, which certainly is part of it, as well as saying to people or talking to people about, you know, what's happened to them, um, you know, what's wrong with them. I soon kind of realised that it was uh, as, as this expanded and as, as uh, this became more sort of widely adopted and known and expressed in the Australian context that it's a lot more than that. And even that statement around what's happened uh, to you, not what's wrong with you, is actually more about, I think, sometimes how we conceptualize and formulate the work that we do with people rather than it's a uh, direct conversation that we have with people. It's both, but it, it uh, I think for me has a lot more meaning. So um, that 
kind of leads to a trauma-informed care approach, which is really just about understanding how trauma works and so that we set our services to support people and not do harm. Uh, from an informed perspective, that's about the knowledge and the learning, but then it kind of progresses on to the responsive, which is about, well, what are we gonna do with that information? And that's a little bit about what we're talking about today. And then there's the kind of the other end of that, which is the specific end where potentially it is that people um, and workers and services go on to be able to provide a trauma specific response. That's uh, because of that journey I've been on over a number of years, that's uh, where I've taken myself, mainly because I wanna do better. And uh, because I was finding that I was coming across this consistently. So, uh, and, and that's just my experience, but it's also been my experience paralleling the sector over that number of decades. My uh, first start in the AOD field was working in a residential environment and then it's kind of progressed into youth work and, and other areas. Um, but in my time in the AOD field, I've really seen that there was a period of time uh, that either we weren't aware as a service, and, and I'm reflecting on this myself as well, I'm not kind of putting it all externally out there. Um, and, and with that, it wasn't discussed. Um, partly, I think that uh, could be attributed to the fact that uh, a lot of alcohol and drug in the way it's been developed as a treatment in the service sector over this century has been, or, and last century is because it was kind of, you know, signed by men for men. So these are the things that we don't talk about, possibly. Uh, as well as then, um, I think probably about 10 years ago, I started to notice uh, probably the late 2000s that there was a lot more awareness coming through. I was having, hearing formulations and conceptualizations and conversations around uh, that people had experienced trauma. It was being kind of noticed or it was um, a lot more uh, uh, kind of in the conversation. But it was then kind of accompanied by a sense of, well, it's not the focus, or if it's not, you know, the AOD is the primary and I need to address that, or that needs to be addressed first, and maybe later on we'll look at that, but not now. And then, fortunately, I think with the uh, trauma-informed care approach, which really is nothing new, it's kind of, uh, I think it's really the way that we all like to think that we're delivering services and interacting particularly with our clients and with each other. I just like that trauma-informed care now has kind of packaged it up and spotlighted it and made it, uh, you know, sort of a, a, uh, a live and dynamic conversation at the moment that we are looking at, is that the case? Um, this is what we think we're doing. What are we actually doing in this way? So now I think there's a lot more awareness, but uh, probably what maybe is a conversation that I hear a lot about is, but, but it's not our scope as a service or it's not my scope as a practitioner. And I can understand the anxieties there um, and uh, you know the concerns. And also sometimes it's even just basically a resource issue. Uh, what I've done, I've done personally and uh, taken myself kind of further along that journey uh, for out of my own kind of desire. But um, I suppose I just want in the conversation before we start talking about some of the, you know, sort of the factors around gender that come into this uh, sort of uh, space, that a lot of what AOD clinicians already do is really consistent with doing good work with people. We don't usually with our approaches, and I think about like harm reduction approaches, all of those sorts of things really actually embody the concept of collaboration and choice, some of the fundamental, fundamental principles of trauma-informed care. We know that we need to build engagement and safety with people. We do a lot of work with people around identifying ways to, to better regulate themselves, to be able to put the brakes on difficult experiences or emotions and those types of things. So I could talk here a lot and, the adoption of a motivational interviewing type consistent approach by a lot of uh, the AOD sector over the past 20 years or probably a little bit longer to combat those kind of confrontational approaches, which were the, uh, the standard traditional ways of working. All of those things uh, create a good environment for people who are experiencing these difficulties. Whether that's gonna be sufficient and enough 
well, that's going to be very much down to the individual. But I guess I just really want to acknowledge that I think uh, all of us are on this informed, responsive, specific continuum at, at different points. And uh, I just really want to acknowledge that and not in any way, um, yeah, don't want to make this more complex than it kind of needs to be, if that makes sense. So this is a slide from one of our trainings, which I will uh, promote shortly. And uh, some of our good team here who have put this together. But this is actually from SAMHSA. It's SAMHSA's definition about what is trauma-informed care. Uh, and really, it's, it's, it's a service approach, which just looks to the fact that, okay, if we know this about trauma, uh, well, how does that affect what we do? If we realize, if we recognize, how do we respond? And how do we make sure that we resist, you know, doing harm or re-traumatizing people? So again, uh, that kind of has implications at an individual as well as in, at, a, at organizational levels. So uh, what it's not here, as you can see, is about, okay, how do I do trauma related or trauma specific uh, therapy? So what are the underlying principles then? What does it mean um, to be able to provide or in a responding way if I'm informed about trauma? What does it look like? This is again, a slide from one of our uh, trainings here. Uh, so rather than get you to interpret, I'll put up what the five circles mean and I'll let you draw the dots between which one is which. But uh, it's about having that approach that is aware and is conscious of uh, in our interactions with each other, with our interactions with our clients, how are we at a universal level maximizing safety, trustworthiness in us, how are we supporting choice, collaboration, and fostering empowerment? Because all of those things, as the trauma-informed care talk, literature talks about, can be helpful antidotes, not necessarily total cures, but can be helpful antidotes to ensure that people feel supported, that they maybe have the opportunity for safety and stabilization, and uh, that they don't get rehabbed in the process of engaging with services. So uh, just a little bit of a plug here for some of the resources that we have that um, my great colleagues have been involved in developing and refining over a period of time with a focus on the AOD practice that uh, we have e-learnings that are available to access anytime. You can get those from the insight.qld.edu.au website. We're also running uh, workshops. I think uh, the calendar for uh, semester one next year will be out um, in the coming weeks, well before Christmas anyway. So let's have a little bit of a conversation around, okay, what do we need when we think about men? Uh, just a few minutes of a conversation before we talk, move into that area of respond, because that's the area I really wanna focus on today to give you some of my experience and ideas as well as to, because this is a practice conversation also obtaining your ideas and thoughts. Does gender matter? Do we need to be thinking about what might be some of the underlying uh, concerns and issues or um, kind of cultural uh, factors that are involved in that? What do we need to realize and recognize? What do we need to look at around things like the prevalence of trauma uh, with men, maybe the potential impact? I am going to spend only a few minutes on these and I'm aware that it's a much, much bigger topic and I'm not doing it justice, but it's so that we can then advance into talking about, okay, how do we, what are some ideas for responding? What are some of your ideas I'm, I'm wanting to learn today as well? And uh, in that area of realizing and recognizing, there's a lot of uh, training and it's really good. And if you've ever done any trauma-informed care kind of work, you'll see that a lot of that focus is on uh, things like um, the prevalence, which is kind of great to know, uh, particularly when you're working in alcohol and drug. And I think it's almost neglectful if we don't kind of look at that stuff because it is so prevalent. Um, the Then things like the recognizing, you know, how does it impact on people? And there's a lot of really good information from the neuroscience literature and research that's gone on now that we've got Gucci ways to investigate people's uh, brains in non-invasive ways. We're starting to see a lot more about 
uh, what goes on in the brain and then make those kind of uh, steps towards, well, what are the clinical implications for that in terms of brain behavior relationships and body relationships and all of that sort of stuff. That's really good. I'm not gonna go into so much of that stuff today. There is some really early literature that's starting to suggest that ways that trauma affects the brain at a neurological level is different to men's women, but I'm not a neurologist. So, and it's really, really early. And that, that, that work is, um, uh, still in its infancy, so uh, I'm not feeling you know that it's something that we uh, need to focus on now. But what I'm going to want to do is add another layer, which is about socialization, um, and that's where there's some really good stuff out at the moment around the neuroscience. There's some good stuff around different culture and being working in trauma informed care ways with different cultural groups. I'm just adding that kind of gender layer, and you can't add gender without kind of looking at socialization, which is. Uh, what we're going to focus on today. So what do we need to realise about um, our men that access our services? And I'm speaking here now to my colleagues in the AOD field because uh, that's where I really, that's where my knowledge and practice is and uh, our, our purpose today in this webinar is that, uh, you know, you look at different research, uh, pulled a few together, there's some really good writers in this field, uh, Catherine Mills there, uh, her article mentioned she's an uh, Australian um, based researcher and uh, author and clinician. And uh, if you put it all together, we're kind of looking at prevalence rates that for, for men who, who, who meet the criteria of a PTSD diagnosis and talking about the DSM PTSD diagnosis there, which has you know, a few problematic issues because it's, it's quite a narrow as to what actually constitutes uh, a criterion A or a traumatic event under the DSM. But we'll just go with uh, something that we all probably is reasonably common language for us. But 65% of men experience one or more substance use disorders. Uh, that, uh, and, and that's in a clinical population, obviously, of men accessing treatment. Uh, looking then at kind of uh, what are some of the more I guess, uh, impacting types of uh, trauma, I mean, or, tra or traumatic type events, uh, looking at the ABS data of what men are reporting around their sexual violence since the age of 15. And then in that same service survey under the age of 15, acknowledge that those rates are uh, lower than for men than they are for women, but uh, we're just kind of keeping in this space. Uh, I think it's also a very valid conversation to have the discussion around how gender impacts trauma-informed care with women. But today we're looking at the men and also looking at some research from Braveheart. So all, all Australian kind of based researchers, there's a lot more out there. Trying to distill it down was, um, was uh, uh, you know, a focus so that we just recognise that basically it's very prevalent. Uh, and not only is it prevalent, but we start to see some trends and some patterns here. Uh, and, and sexual abuse is not the only form of trauma, I'm realizing, uh, I realize that, but in terms of being able to get some reasonable data and even that then, I think we're still quite behind in specific research and reporting and how much we can put faith in these things. But let's just kind of go with the fact that it's very, very uh, prevalent and particularly in populations accessing alcohol and drug treatment services. In terms of, uh, again, we have some great resources at Inside and a trauma-informed toolkit on our webpage. But just to basically kind of look at, well, if we're looking at some of them, what are the common features? Uh, and now I recognize that all genders can experience all these different types of sim symptoms, but what tends to show up a little bit more in that kind of external way for men? Um, more commonly, we see some of the other features that are mentioned there, irritability, impulsivity, uh, comorbid substance use disorders are often more common in men who have a trauma diagnosis, paranoia, and that kind of edge, that really kind of edginess uh, at all times, often mixed up with diagnosis of like antisocial personality disorder. And I will admit it, there's some research that shows that Psychologists are not very good at identifying uh, trauma and trauma-related conditions in males. Um, so it's, uh, it often kind of gets mixed up with other things. So 
that's kind of a bit of the, the stuff that we need to realize in terms of prevalence as well as sort of uh, symptoms. And as I said, it was just a very brief little look at that so that we can move on to, okay, what else do we need to realize that impacts, particularly in uh, traditional male um, hegemonies and, and traditional masculinity, what other things can really impact not only the experience of trauma, but more importantly, the recovery paths, what might we need to know and then talk about what, how we respond to that. So a couple of things, there's a few frameworks that, or models or ideas that I've taken from other people that I use and I use, have used them a lot in my practice. One's about 40 years old and it's been refined by different authors over the time. The one that's 40 years old, some of you may have heard of, is called the man Bucks culture. Um, I use this one a lot when I'm in those conversations with uh, men about looking to kind of help them understand different aspects of their responses, as well as also starting to move and shift what is uh, rigid type thinking into more sort of adapt adaptive and flexible and conscious type thinking where men make more choices about uh, some of their ways of thinking and responses and attitudes versus this kind of unbeknown kind of force that is, that is existing. So the man box is, is really kind of a nice little simple explanation. And I've actually used a physical box in, in, uh, in sessions at different times that sets up this, this, this idea that um, uh, there's a dominant form of masculinity. Many of you may have heard of it. Some of the authors, Kibble, Parsons, Green's been the more recent one who's kind of picked this up and um, described it. And it just really implies that there's a certain, uh, a very rigid set of expectations and perceptions of behaviors about what is manly behavior. And um, it's quite a hierarchical system. And it's brutally, and it might seem like, okay, oh, well, that seems a bit kind of, you know, just suck it up and get over it, which is really actually just kind of re-traumatizing men again, the idea that you've got to avoid these things and move on. But um, what, this is actually quite brutally enforced, this traditional set of kind of um, um, expectations from the dominant culture on the side of uh, males. It's policed by language, by people being shamed and bullied for being anything other than all of those types of things. And uh, it comes then with an expectation that all behaviors, well, those behaviors that are going to allow you to be rewarded and accepted and be considered a, a, a real man, I'm sort of going to the extremes here, I know, are those that fit within the box and anything outside of the box that's not homogenous is suspect or uh, perceived with um, as being a violation. There's a lot of this kind of uh, information out there. I'm just introducing it. I, I find it a nice little long to talk with men and then we can kind of flip between that idea of in, in the box, out of the box, uh, or reshaping the box is actually where I've had more success in terms of that adaptive, flexible response to things, not trying to completely um, move people's views if that's not needed. But if we, this was developed in America, so I acknowledge that, but there's some, been some really good re recent research and a nice report published by the Jesuit Society and their men's project in 2018 that looked at the concepts of the man box and uh, had a survey and a sample of young men 18 to 30. Some good news that uh, there is in, in indications in that that there's some shifts away from not necessarily being uh, accepting everything that's in the man box. But the research does show that the man box rules and restrictive practices are alive and well and flourishing. And the things that we're talking about there is that it's, uh, you know, to be a man, it's about being strong. It, to be a man, it's not about you know, it's about not showing emotion, um, that it's, uh, or any form of um, vulnerability, that you've always got to be in control, completely self-aligned and independent, and you're the primary provider. And some of those kind of un, uh, un, very unhelpful kind of attitudes that, that lead to often harm to others, and in particular, harm to women in the lives of these men as well. So we're not through it yet. 
um, there's been a shift. I think that is uh, about where how where culture is going. But we are still living with uh, younger men and older men living up to these pressures uh, that they they need to fit this set of rules. So I'm just introducing that, and and just from a bit of a, a funny point of view, um, in the in my kind of uh, paraphrasing of the comedian Bill Burr, uh, the man box kind of means that you you know for men you can't go around saying that you want a cupcake or that you'd like a piece of quiche or that the slight rain outside that uh, we might actually ask ourselves the question, should I carry an umbrella? Now, for some of you that might seem a little bit silly, but for a lot of men out there, I'm sure there's been at times where, you know, there's maybe been a, given a bit of pause uh, that these things are alive uh, to making decisions about like this or, or verbally expressing them. And uh, just for a bit of tongue in cheek kind of focus on that because humour is very important in working with men as well, as we'll go on to talk about. The other little, uh, I guess, um, conceptualization of this that I use is uh, from a, an, a, an author um, and a clinician who has done a lot of work with men. I actually first heard him speak at that 2011 conference where I kind of learned about trauma-informed care. Uh, and he, this uh, chap, Dan Griffiths, has put out a a nice little group program called Helping Men Recover, um, which is which has got some really nice kind of ideas and practices and activities in it. Um, but he's put out this kind of list of um, man rules about what it kind of means to be a man, and if you're not these things, you're a you know you're a square peg in a round hole type thing. And uh, those again are also uh, concepts that I use in those discussions with um, men uh, when we're kind of talking about what's going to get in the way or treatment and hearing type behaviours. Because if you think about what uh, counselling or traditional counselling kind of asks men to do, uh, it's kind of all of those things that um, are on that other side, which again we should really just kind of say, you know, get over it and move on, or that might be one approach to doing it. But this stuff runs deep. Uh, we're not talking about um, ideas that are, you know, kind of read on the internet that men have adopted. These things have been reinforced through culture, through relationships, um, through uh, experiences of uh, their growing up in the playgrounds um, with their peers in society at lots of levels. So it is a big thing for a man to be involved in coming to seek help. So let's talk about that and recognize some of the things that kind of go on as a result of these kind of cultural, uh, I guess, uh, precursors and underpinnings. And I'm just going to make sure I keep an eye on time or ask my good wingmen here to keep me on track. So. Uh, the way this kind of plays out, and I'm making huge leaps in the uh, kind of uh, the, the psychobiosocial literature here in, in a big way, is we start to see these really rigid patterns um, that reflect that kind of man box restrictive ways that um, I can be, the, uh, how I can um, operate and how I should uh, be able, you know, be seen by others as well very, very uh, strongly and quite brutal. And, and just remember that a lot of um, men, when we're talking about those who've really kind of adopted these rigid patterns, they've seen other men punished for this. So there's not just a gleeful acceptance of these patterns, there's also a fear to not step outside of them so that uh, the rewards cease and um, I actually start to experience the opposite. So very rigid patterns, and we also see that, we're starting to see that come up in uh, other, other ways and other comments. And I'll just, again, come back to that kind of, uh, that area of trauma related to uh, sexual abuse and violation and those types of things as for children and adults um, as men. And the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to uh, Child Sexual Abuse speak about this in their final report, which was published in 2017. I've highlighted some sections there around, okay, well, what are these male socialization factors? How do they play out in, for example, the pathways to recovery and potentially uh, treatment uh, uh, 
responses and what should we need to know. So uh, I just kind of refer to that there just to kind of highlight these, um, uh, this kind of great coalescence of huge amount of research and testimonies and stories that came together in that final report. Really kind of got some, um, if you're working with whether it be women or men, um, and uh, I'm putting a men's lens on it today, it's really good to kind of go through some of the findings that they made. Um, they're really kind of consistent with what we would expect that this is contemporary in terms of Australian society and Australian men's and women's stories. So why then are these disclosures difficulty? Some, there were some hints there in what the Royal Commission report found. Others are here. Um, what are the barriers, say, to sexual abuse? I, but also some of these barriers are also playing out in other forms of trauma as well. Some are specific to uh, sexual-based trauma. I've highlighted in red those two terms there, self-reliant and find solutions. I want to talk about those more because I think that's where, that's what's really, uh, one of the things that's really harming men about this kind of whole man box, man rules culture, this idea that I need to independently be able to deal with stuff. And that's not just being, um, I guess it can be considered to be arrogant or stubborn or obstinate. It's actually kind of, um, I've, I've, I've inhabited the homeland of grow, growing up uh, as a male in, in Australian society. Um, I've decided to draw my barriers and lines very differently to the man box, but I breathe this air. This is kind of big stuff um, that it's also, uh, and again, a shout out to the Australian Men, Men's Health Forum and their submission around male suicide. Uh, and they've got some great stuff on their website, um, the crew down there really start to talk about this, um, this outside in model of uh, helping to um, address suicide with men where, you know, don't necessarily kind of go looking for the, you know, the organic mental health issues and those sorts of things with male that's there, but it's not as common as maybe uh, other models would suggest. Look for the stuff where, uh, you know, something's happening uh, to a man uh, and he's trying to fix it. He's trying to be self-reliant, he's trying to find solutions, and those aren't working. That's when you start to see that kind of move into things like suicide becoming the answer for us, alcohol and drug becoming the answer. So I will talk a little bit about those um, in a few moments' time because I think they, they, they show up in our work a lot. And uh, the other ones there are, again, probably many of you would have come across these. So today is just a little bit of a refresher and a reminder, but they are good and to have in our, in our, I guess, in the back of our mind around as we approach a trauma-informed care approach with men, um, what might be going on in their minds. That visibility of services is the last dot point. That's getting better, uh, but it, you know, generally uh, it, it is hard to kind of know uh, or to break that perception. I, idea or challenge that perception that services are uh, mainly there for children or women and um, you know is there anything there for men. So with that and as we move into talking about responding with the underlying cultural kind of uh, perspectives the underkinding underlying kind of cultural restraints it is very common and I hear this a lot that the, even the word trauma for a man can conjure up and uh, evoke ideas of weakness, um, particularly if I need to ask for help. That's, uh, that's a big kind of um, step. So let's now talk about responding. And I'm only gonna be sharing just some of my ideas here. They're in no particular order, uh, nor are they exhaustive, but hopefully some ideas and I'd love to get your comments throughout this around what other ideas you might have. Okay, so bringing trauma-informed care. Um, really want to encourage that the, uh, the approach with um, men is about offering help, not necessarily waiting for men to come and seek help, which is why we've got this title about bringing. A few reasons for that. Um, men are kind of ultimate, um, you know, and particularly in the traditional 
masculinity. This is not me. I would call myself Captain. Well, no, this would be me because I'm kind of Captain Klutz with stuff. But um, men want to do it themselves. Okay, they want to kind of fix it themselves. Uh, they generally the strategy they, strategies they'll adopt is to suppress, to internalize, to uh, withdraw um, before seeking, um, you know, and and try and nut it out themselves before trying to uh, get any sort of help. So little things can matter. Um, little things can matter. And uh, so that's why one of the things that I would, I tend to do in my practice is, is just reflect on things like language and labels. And I, I need to make sure that I'm kind of moving through reasonably quickly to, uh, and I'd love you to throw in your ideas here and I'll get Jim to curate those and kind of uh, give us some summary of that and you'll be able to see everyone's chat. Some of the alternative labels I use is, uh, you know, because to get around that stuff, men don't do therapy, men don't do counselling, or those words causing and evoking a reactions from this kind of, you know, underlying socialisation and cultural norms that people may have been kind of immersed in, even unknowingly, is I've I talk about probably orientation visits, the one that I use the most, uh, trial, tryout, education session, you know, come, come uh, looking forward to meeting you for, you know, just an orientation visit, it's an opportunity, I'll give you a tour of the service, we'll sit down, have a coffee, a bit of a talk, you can ask me questions about what we do. Uh, thinking of those four principles, safety, trustworthiness, choice, collaboration, empowerment, from the very beginning of engagement. Um, Really big focus we need in work with men to, um, you know, we, we do need to challenge the stuff that needs challenging. I'm not saying that straight talk is really important in working with men, um, but to validate and respect strengths. Going back to that idea that men uh, have this kind of uh, socialized perspective on needing to be self-reliant and independent and to fix things or be the fixer and the provider is that uh, we need to really validate that attempts to deal with things and the strengths that men show in doing that um, are, you know, that that's kind of good stuff. Good on you for giving that a go. Good on you for, you know, trying out many things. Uh, sometimes it is right to stay silent, but sometimes it isn't. Um, you know, that desire to succeed, desire to persevere and to take risks, that needs to kind of happen. Uh, because a man coming into treatment or an orientation visit, whatever we want to call it, is effectively kind of breaking the code and the rules. And, and I'm talking again, not all men in the diverse continuum, but for a lot of men that we see um, or that I've seen because of the areas I've worked in, um, military and in the court system, this has kind of been very much the style that they've adopted. It needs to be validated because they're very vulnerable at that point and all the way through strengths respected is a really important thing. This actually is a little saying I only picked up recently, um, great organisation living down the Gold Coast, uh, who I've discovered recently that a previous army colleague currently is working at as the psychologist there, but they had a podcast with uh, Sally Fletcher Thomas from mantherapy.org and they use a lot of humour, I encourage you to have a look at their website. And it's kind of that idea that, um, you know, we might talk about men's strengths, but the conversations that I have, and this is one I will now use, I've used another one, is that idea that, okay, well, that's fine. These things have worked for you uh, in a lot of areas, but they don't necessarily work in things like fixing mental health. You can't fix mental health with stuff like duct tape. What I use when I talk about, say, uh, the emotional challenges and the adverse experiences that come from trauma, is I use the idea of a cast because trauma is a Greek word that means wound. So I talk about uh, with men often, because it seems most have broken a bone at some point and had some sort of um, you know reparative uh, structure around that to get it to heal, is that um, when there's a wound, we put a cast around it, that helps to protect it and to uh, you know take away the pain or the difficulty. But if we keep that cast on too long, if we're using those skills or those types of um, ways of thinking and attitudes, it eventually it starts to actually cause harm and it doesn't allow true healing to occur. So um, the cast, and I just put that up there, that's, I actually have a, a picture like that, it's not the exact picture, um, but um, where I refer to that as one way of talking about uh, what it's kind of like, what's gone on, 
validating what men have done in putting that cast on, but maybe at some point we need to look at, okay, are there other ways of doing that? Another focus I have is very much on um, constantly emphasizing choice and control uh, around uh, helping to take time to establish all those principles to give men the permission to press pause at any time, to completely do anything opposite to what the trauma has done, which has taken away the choice, whether that be a sexual, physical, or uh, created other types of created or natural type trauma that people have experienced through. Again, this is where I think our work in alcohol and drug is really, really helpful because we do a lot of work with people about how to apply the brakes, like Rothschild in her book, um, kind of The Body Remembers, talks about. We do a lot of work around helping people put the brakes on um, kind of those kind of physiological type uh, arousals. And we might call them cravings, we might call them kind of urges, whatever it might be. But there's a lot of work we do that helps people to do all these things to help create safety and stabilization. Um, I talk, talk a lot about uh, how I do consent, which is never blanket consent uh, with anybody, man or woman, but um, really kind of overplay it a lot with working with men that it's kind of that. So it's never sign a form and you know for the whole duration here, that will cover you and I'll share information with everyone as a result. It's always an individual conversation. I think that's ethical as well as it also helps. I want to talk about the um, Hexaflex model, which comes from the acceptance and commitment therapy. But for anyone who knows that work, or if you're looking for a really good way of kind of working with that stuff around psychological rigidity, with these types of socialization norms that we might be dealing with with men and e along with their co-occurring alcohol and drug, the uh, ACT type approach really is kind of useful because it looks at that stuff around, okay, uh, what, am, uh, what are the ideas? What's showing up for me? What are my thoughts? I use this approach a lot with uh, having those conversations during orientation visits. Okay, what's it like for you to come to therapy? You know, what was the thought process coming here? What's showing up for you now? Uh, as well as then kind of moving into a lot of focus around values and, and looking at those workable actions versus unworkable. And that's something that we have to be very careful of with men in treatment is that because of that idea of being problem solvers, when they come to us, they're actually in their mind, they're coming here, okay, what's going to fix this and how are you going to help me fix this? So we need to have really clear ability to kind of help people understand the expectations of what a therapeutic process is, as well as what therapy or treatment, whatever we want to call it, um, or training, um, it's another nice word to use with um, men, what it will look like. Because if we come running at them with our diagnosis or even our words about trauma or our mindfulness kind of uh, language, it's a bit like kind of running through the room, um, you know, and just kind of, you know, presenting something that just feels completely foreign and out of place. Because a man is there like, how, how's this going to help me? How's this going to fix me? And that kind of language doesn't necessarily uh, help make those, join those dots between how I'm going to get this better. Um, so we might need to spend some time really explaining, giving the specifications about what this might look like, how we, what we would be doing, what our intent is, um, and uh, that's, uh, so that little definition there is one that I often, other than the word wound, I don't tend to use the word trauma a lot, particularly when I'm in the early stages of working with someone, is that uh, I also put behavior in there as well, not just uh, emotional or mental problems. Okay, men want fixes. So uh, that's kind of what they want. So treatment needs to very, very quickly move into practical ideas about what might support people. I've gone to Beyond Blue and their research around this and what men actually with their voices say about what are their top five things that they generally think will uh, they'll be able to do that could help with some of the difficulties and the struggles. And thinking about in our AOD work, we often are giving a lot of uh, maybe uh, kind of ideas and practical tips and active type things for people to do. Um, you know, keeping diaries or kind of um, doing schedules. Here's a couple of others uh, to share with you about what men say will work. Interestingly, number 11 was talking to someone. So it's not the first thing to kind of go for. Uh, kind of sedentary or non-active type strategies generally are not the ones that we would go for. I mean, you might want to expand this, talk to your men around this. I have some uh, great uh, women colleagues who shared with me how they talk a lot with men around in their adaptation of working with men, 
I know you want to introduce mindfulness, but they'll talk to them first around, okay, well, when do you feel relaxed? What does that look like? What's going on there? And how can we rec recreate that? Rather than coming at the other way, where it's about this is mindfulness, that, that it's about kind of going to where a man has already identified that there's a fix and a solution and kind of building and expanding and how can we kind of make that something that is more accessible. And uh, another little thing here, and I'm also realizing that, gosh, doesn't the time go quickly, um, is that uh, in terms of men's interactional style, I like finding good little YouTube clips. Um, I'll give you one in a minute that's from us here that was generated from inside. I like finding good little uh, clips, uh, good little stories, particularly on the internet and kind of setting up a treatment room a bit like what is a male favored interactional style with uh, another person, which is kind of that shoulder to shoulder stuff. There's some gold standard stuff going on in uh, male dominated industries such as construction. Some of you may have heard of mates in construction. They've got that brokerage case management model, but the idea is that kind of shoulder to shoulder type style and interaction. Um, and uh, they're leveraging off that. Uh, uh, it's something I uh, used and tried, and then you can kind of engage around the material rather than, because then you can ask what a person thinks. It's never, uh, you know, asking a man, man will generally tell you how, what he's thinking, not necessarily what he's feeling. So uh, engaging and front end loading the material and doing that in kind of the interactional styles that suit men can reduce that, as well as showing people stories other men's stories about this happened to me and this is what I did about it really is powerful. Helps to reduce stigma, helps reduce isolation. I'm not alone, I'm not the only one because that self-reliance, that independence, that fix it myself type mentality has generally had men stuck in that space. This is a little one, I'll quickly move through this. Trauma in the brain. It's a really nice little video that kind of looks at that stuff around how, um, probably from a self-medication perspective and hypothesis point of view, how alcohol kind of and trauma can be uh, interrelated. A little one to show and engage with. The other thing I'd say, and I apologies that I run out of time um, in being able to go through this probably more thoroughly than I'd like to, is that I do, again, this is a conversation for individual clinicians and services, and I'm just putting it out there, a space where I've come to is that because of that, um, idea that uh, to challenge that idea that men don't do therapy and men don't seek help. They actually do and they do talk. Um, I can attest to that. But generally, you've got to offer it. You've got to offer it first. You've got to ask because of all the cultural layers and the socialization layers that prevent men from talking. Uh, uh, my, myself, I don't want to collude with that stuff um, and continue to promote shame and silence. Uh, I actually ask the questions. The way I've landed on that is just a very simple non-committal, well, it's not simple, it's quite um, kind of meaningful in a way, but a non-committal way where using the life events checklist, um, which is available from that website there, that just asks men to endorse for anybody, whether they've experienced any of those 16 types of natural or creative type tra potentially traumatic events, as well as anything else that might be not included in that list, whether it's happened to me or witnessed to me, and that's something I do uh, as part of a standard engagement process. I, I, I advise my clients that it's not something that I'm going to be asking them about today, but it's something, would it be okay if we come back and revisit it? And generally, um, uh, you know, I, I, I just give you there um, a sample from, this is taken between 2018 and 19 of 166 clients, men and women. As you can see, they're a much smaller group of women kind of goes with the cohort I was working with. Um, that, uh, that's kind of the reports around in that first endorsement about what's happened to me. So transports, accidents, serious accidents, physical assault, weapons assault, sexual assault, unwanted sexual contact, those types of things. Um, we're, we're seeing really kind of high rates. This is a really useful tool then to come back and have a conversation. Um, I always ask permission to be able to come back to this a couple of sessions once some safety and trust has been established, once people have got some scaffolding to be able to apply the brakes if emotions come up, to be able to kind of go, well, this is what you said then, I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit more about the impact. I stay away from things like the, uh, and look, you might have your own tools, all good, but I stay away from those that kind of look at uh, screening for uh, trauma um, reactions because it's a little bit too compounded with 
trust issues as well as what could be withdrawal issues or the effects of substances around, you know, am I having difficulty to sleep? Am I having kind of mood swings, all that sort of thing. So um, I won't go through this case study, but I'll just briefly mention that this is actually a, a live example of a responses from a client I worked with. And under item nine there, that kind of, you know, happened to me unwanted, that actually, by that being endorsed and then the conversations in the trust and the privilege I had to work with this particular client moved into what was actually quite sustained, protracted systemic uh, sexual abuse that had been going on since the age of 10 and uh, really opened that conversation up. I would say that we need to, if we are going to do screening, the other side of that is where, where we're comfortable with our working, but if we're not to have really direct warm referral and linkage pathways. If you're wanting to know a little bit about what trauma treatment might look like, so you can talk to your men about it. Phoenix Australia, the new guidelines were published in 2020 about um, the guidelines for prevention and treatment of acute stress disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and complex PTSD. I'm glad that they're talking about complex PTSD. It's, uh, there's a lot of work there, but you can kind of download it by chapter and uh, gives you a really good idea around that. Working with men and emotions, quick advice there, go slow, don't go straight for the emotions. Uh, I uh, use things like um, these little, uh, the anger funnel, the anger iceberg, the anger tree to expand that conversation around emotions, what's going on. Uh, usually uh, these are after trust and safety has been built. Because my aim very much has been to kind of bring a lot of that stuff that has come from the socialization spokes space, the man box, the man rules, to bring that out in the open so that we can actually have a conscious conversation about that, about how a person may choose to respond, uh, to be aware of it, to, to know it, not necessarily to be able to completely throw it out the window because that's kind of not easy or where people get to, but to reshape it and to be able to make more of a choice. Other little things in our services, having pictures of uh, men, um, you know, these things maybe seem little, but they send powerful messages about who's welcome here, um, who's accepted here, and uh, who uh, can be involved. I always say balance as well, that it's good for us to have information around the fact that from a gender point of view, violence, particularly intimate and family violence is committed by males. So we should be having information about that out there and available uh, for all people, but there's a balance to that also and uh, reflecting the fact that men experience violence as well. I think uh, it's a dialectic that we can have those two truths in the same space. And this is from a Tasmanian resource called the Blokes Book where they have this on one page and then on the opposite page, they have the other to keep that balance. I also note that when we have um, men who break the code, who may be disclosed, whether it's intentional or accidental or purposeful, whatever it might be, something I always do is talk to men about what might show up to them when they leave this session about having broken the code or the man rules, that there may be a bit of a recoil back into that kind of self-reliance or that independence or that kind of protected because of shame and uh, withdrawing. I always have that conversation so that um, we're preempting what might come to get in the way of treatment or someone coming back if that is ever going on. I'd like to talk to you more about how I make those conversations really uh, kind of over in the early stages of working with people about, look, sometimes we find this is kind of going on for people, particularly with alcohol and drugs. It's very normal that this is something that we see just starting to send those kind of messages, little things that can be corrective and helpful. So I did want to have a practice conversation. Um, I pretty much kind of run out of time for that. Um, so I'm just wondering, Jim, if anything popped up in the chat that we might need to reflect on. I think you're going to, I've asked uh, for the chat to be saved for you, James, because there's way more comments than we usually get. Um, okay. And many of them is just useful comments that you, okay. I think you will find, uh, yeah. you know, just feeding on to what you've already talked about. But there's also several questions. So firstly, I want to say thank you. Um, we've also, before you even finished your presentation, we've already had many, many people asking if you will uh, do a second one for us next year. 
um, to build on what you've already done. That's, so that's, I'm, that's kind. <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot now and say we're going to book you in next year um, to build on from what you've already done. But let's go through some of the things that people have written in. So uh, one definitely was, from your opinion, is it better for a male to see a male? Now, we had many variations of this question. Um, and mm -hmm. so I'm going to say some of the things that have come. Um, and obviously some are saying that, you know, potentially if the trauma was committed by a male to a male, then they may find that difficult. Yeah. Um, and there's many other co comments made, but I'd like your feedback on that. Oh, yeah, look, this one comes up a lot. It's a good question. Thank you for whoever's put those in. And I'm, I'm looking forward to reading the comments um, because I'm still learning in this space as well. Look, uh, let, let's go back to the principles here about kind of safety, trustworthiness, choice, collaboration and empowerment. So it's ultimately going to be client directed. I think we always need to um, uh, kind of uh, consider that and have those kind of even conversations. And again, in that stuff around setting up safety, if we are, if, depending on what the gender kind of balance is, uh, that that can be shifted and changed and men can press pause on that. Um, so same as with women, but I'm talking about men today. My general view is, um, I, I, look, there, there's arguments on both sides or there's also support on both sides. For women working with men, often men uh, prefer that because they feel more comfort. Um, there's a sense of more relational sensitivity that they get in terms of uh, from, from a woman um, than they feel they would get from a man. Sometimes they're actually kind of requested. My experience has been, and I was looking at some stuff by Nathan um, Beale in this, who wrote on this a few years ago. Um, sometimes uh, their partners, or their female partners, have actually told them, you've got to see a woman because they kind of want that kind of female perspective being kind of, um, you know, presented to, to their partner, to their male. Um, also, it's because they don't trust males and 80% of, say, sexual abuse or even physical, physical assaults and weapons assaults are perpetrated by males. So that comes into it. Uh, that's really good. And I think that um, for women, um, there's all a really good opportunity to be able to introduce uh, women-oriented perspectives. To, to males in that environment um, around countering and helping to adapt and make more flexible some of that uh, socialization we've spoken about. For men working with men, um, look again, um, I've done a lot of that. And I guess I'm a man, so I only, I only know this space. Um, I, I, what I would say, and some of it's up on that um, slide I've just put up there, there uh, is that where it, that can be really powerful in terms of role modeling uh, about what I said before, I grew up in this homeland, I've breathed this same air, this is, this is where I've landed on it, this is how I interpret it. Um, that can, as well as you know, bringing in other men's stories, but that can be really positive. Uh, but for men, we have to be particularly careful of masculine fusion where we kind of let stuff go um, that may be not helpful, that continues to reinforce or re-traumatize people by reinforcing the the uh, kind of those stereotypes around, yeah, boys want to be boys, or, you know, it's kind of like um, uh, all that sort of stuff, like I've kind of got up there around, you know, it's kind of like, well, you know, yeah, we're just, we're just agreeing with those ideas around, you know, just toughen up and it'll be fine. Um, if we're doing group work, I, I, where I, this is where I probably would get a little bit more kind of um, specific and say that uh, I think it's good to have a gender balance, but I think you should always have at least one male as a co-facilitator in a group, because again, it's about that role modeling and that's really important in that environment. Um, so yeah, that would be my views. Uh, so sort of both ways really. <laughs> yeah, cool. um, now I've uh, got a couple of things. Uh, and if anyone needs to go, that's fine. I won't, it, it's and I, 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 sh I should say that James <laughs> is a bit of a legend and his email is available on our website. And if you do want to just get in touch, I'm sure he wouldn't have a problem with that if you do have to. I, re I refer back to my comments on the Common Garden variety. I don't know about Um So you said one of the comments you made was uh, you, you tend to look at what's happened to the person rather than what's wrong with the person, which is obviously something in AOD we kind of adopt that as a bit of a philosophy. Yeah. Um, but it, what it suggests is that substance use is a symptom of something else and often a symptom of trauma as we're talking about today. But actually, if we're taking that approach, really, uh, trauma is potentially a symptom of society, that society has, you know, has allowed people to get to the point where trauma is acceptable. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? Sure. Um, I, <laughs> That's wow. a huge question. No, it's, it's a good one because, I, and again, I'll, I'll try and answer that to the best of my ability. 
Um, look, it is one of the criticisms of trauma-informed care, and, and to a certain extent, it is valid. The trauma-informed care has taken us away from that kind of looking at the broader system, which I think that question is talking yeah. about. About it's it's moving the conversation more towards the sort of the micro level at sort of a uh, individual client or even a service level. It's kind of really bringing it down. I don't mind that because that's the space I occupy. Um, and I think it's good to highlight these things, but I do I do acknowledge that yeah, where it does then kind of almost turn the spotlight off over there. What are we doing as a society around uh, these things? And um, you know, particular and again, um, not just for men, but for the gender gendered issues that go on around things like violence and violence towards women and, and those sorts of things. I think we should always have a an eye on both. Um, yeah. Definitely. Am I optimistic? I, I am from some of the research that's coming through. I'm also optimistic for, for men, and I'll just come back to the space now that we're talking about, uh, for things like some of these integrated uh, policy statements that's starting to come out to recognise that there's vulnerable groups and that men can be that. Um, I know there might be different kind of views on that, but um, I think the norms are the problem, not men. And I think um, we need to look at the things that are impacting on them, like three out of four suicides, six out, yeah. uh, six men a day uh, out of the eight who commit suicide. Um, I think there's some really good things there. And I, where I'm optimistic, it's strangely enough, it's actually in the area of, um, of uh, industry and uh, commerce and business. I think groups there are starting to see the data. They're starting to see what's going on. They're starting to engage in conversations that aren't just reactive. It's like something's happened, so we've got to you know, quickly address it. They're starting to look at developing up wellness and well-being programs and shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder type peer support networks and things like where it's already in the construction industry. It's, uh, there's good examples of it in the mining industry, transport, logistics. Good examples of it in um, the, the military, of course, all these kind of male dominated areas. So I am, I am kind of hopeful. And also those trends from like the Jesuit society study is starting to show that the, the younger men um, are not necessarily agreeing with everything about the man box. Uh, so I, I, I'm hopeful. Um, and I guess we haven't spoken about it today, but post you know, traumatic or trauma growth is a whole space that's getting a lot of atten more attention now. And um, I really think that that's, uh, that's kind of one of the, the things that also gives me hope. I don't know if I've answered that, um, but I'll, I'll give it, yeah. so I, I believe in um, men's capacity as well. So, yeah, okay. so yeah. that kind of also gives me hope in, the, uh, hope in this area. Well, I've got lots of questions as I say, and some of them are a bit speculative. Um, um, I'm just realizing the time, so. Well, if people yeah. have to go, they go. We'll yeah. keep going so that we have to record it, unless you have something else to oh, I look, I, I put up there just some of the ways that we don't want to re-traumatise. People have hopefully read that as I'm speaking. Just a final word to my fellow travellers out there, and I'm talking to um, the other guys, men out there that work in the alcohol and drug field. We are a smaller number. The Mesita uh, survey on workers that came out in uh, just this year, earlier this year in 2020, our survey results from the alcohol and drug workforce, we're 29% of the population. I just really want to, because uh, trauma-informed care is not always just about our work with clients. It's also about, you know, our own ability to self-reflect, to look after each other and to be, uh, you know, caring. Um, I just would, if anything's, uh, you know, those masculine archetypes, if anything's come up from the conversation today that are affecting, uh, that you might think uh, on your reflection are affecting you in not helpful ways, uh, you know, don't get into self-blame, don't get into um, any sort of issues that's kind of, you've been exposed probably to the same ideals that I have, that pressurise us to be emotionally restrained, assertive, competitive, self-reliant, all those things. I'm not asking anyone to completely throw all that out or change things around, but just be careful of you policing yourself in unhelpful ways. Um, and I just... Uh, speak to my fellow travellers out there in that regard. It's the same message also for a broader group, but um, I'm just kind of keeping it within the, the context of today. So, because we are a small group and we tend to get all the angry males referred to us <laughs> in our clinics. I don't know, that's been my experience. Now, while other people might need to go, are you yeah. good to take a couple more questions? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah.
<laughs> um, okay. Uh, when men use their own past abuse that they've been exposed to as an excuse yeah. for what they're currently doing, how do you tend to respond to that? Yeah, for sure. Um, absolutely. That's, um, and I can understand where that question comes from. And uh, I probably even should have said at the beginning of today, I'm aware that some people out there in our audience may have experienced some of the adverse and negative effects of these socialization concepts that I've spoken about. And if people choose not to work with men as a result of that, none of this today is about trying to shift any of that. Um, that's very straightforward, uh, straight talk conversations, uh, which I've had many times by uh, setting up those things uh, in the beginning around, you know, men can press pause, but where I also need my need to press pause, where I'm going to be someone who's on this journey to point out to you attitudes, ways of thinking that are unhelpful. Generally, my experience has been, and I'm, I'm just kind of shortening this in, and um, um, not make this go on longer. My experience has been um, for a lot of uh, the men I've worked with, it's new information to them when you challenge that, that stuff. And most people will take it on board uh, and consider it and take it on board. And my general experience is people have taken it on board and then changed, at least from what I see, some of their ways of thinking and looking at the world and perspectives. I can't necessarily guarantee that it changes sustainably or uh, whatever uh, in terms of, you know, sometimes behaviors, some, uh, follow people around 24 seven. Um, I will bring partners in a lot. I didn't kind of get into that. That was one of the other things um, uh, to uh, not necessarily the couples therapy, but certainly to be able to kind of work on, you know, the journey or what are the interfering behaviors. Occasionally I have come up with very, very fixed uh, views on um, those things where they've not shifted. Um, you know, where I might be challenging things like that ideal that I'm, I'm entitled to know where people are or my partner is all the time and uh, those sorts of things. So, uh, or that um, someone else is um, driving me to do these behaviors like that kind of excuse stuff we spoke about. Generally, um, that, that within the, the model that I kind of set up about the man box, I find that a really useful tool to kind of go, okay, Let's, let's look at that particular issue that's coming up here around why it is that um, you're needing to, why you've maybe got this view. That's very much sometimes coming from that kind of man box space around being entitled, uh, concepts of power um, and needing to be in control and be the provider, all those really kind of unhelpful things. So the man box framework really helps, has helped me, and I'm not, I am not a, um, an expert in the, say, the, the, the DB field, um, but I come across it a lot, but I find it, the man box helps me to challenge that and kind of have that conversation then narratively around where that is um, consistent, you know, um, where that may be potentially causing problems um, in relationships. I probably, again, I probably haven't answered that one very well, but yeah, no, I'm, thinking of the, I'm thinking of the conversations I've had it's always uh, generally not letting it go through to the keeper, acknowledging, okay, this is one of these things that we've spoken about before that uh, is not necessarily a helpful way, way to deal with things. Um, let's pause and have a look at this. And it's having those ground rules in place at the start yeah. so that you're yeah. able to do that safely. Probably didn't set that in. conversation yeah. up too but much, but yeah, it does it, yeah, it does come up actually. You can't work with men and those things not come up. Um, but. Um, I think I've got too many questions and I know oh, okay. you, you've got stuff to go. To, but I'll, I'll, I want to ask one more before we wrap up. And this is as much for my interest as it is for any, anybody else. And by anybody else that's, in, that's written questions, please, if you, if you need answers, get in touch via email and we'll pass them on. That's, mm. a, that's a definite. Fortunately, his name's James as well. So yeah. you can ask. Between us, we'll, they'll come to us. <laughs> we'll, we'll work it out. But somebody's asked that, uh, that male silence that, uh, yeah. you know, that certainly I was brought up with. Yeah. Is that a Western thing or is that matched in Indigenous culture? So in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, for example, sure. is it something that they have in their culture and that they come with? Or yeah, is it yeah. Um, and, I, and I put some um, caveats on the discussion around the fact that from a cultural perspective, I'm a, a white male. 
um, from that kind of background. So I always uh, value you know, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge or other cultural sure. knowledge in answering these sort of questions. But from that and engaging particularly with cultural supports and working with men from different cultures, this stuff does seem to be quite prevalent. Yep. The shame um, that comes with this and the, not only the shame maybe, uh, and then actually in some cultures, uh, anything to do with uh, sexual abuse and it's absolutely taboo. So there's another, there's another layer of socialization that kind of just continues to you know, spin this hamster wheel of perpetuated silence. Um, but no, I find it to be um, quite absolutely prevalent. And, um, and, and then there's other layers on top of that, obviously, particularly when we're talking about our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander First Nations people of transgenerational trauma, intergenerational sure. trauma, sure. Um, which even kind of had continued to kind of, and, and lack of trust for, um, you know, services and services not necessarily being particularly culturally responsive either. So, uh, no, I find it to be pretty widespread. Um, not just from the, uh, you know, kind of the American, Australian kind of white uh, culture. Thank you. Yeah. Well, listen, we're going to wrap up there. Um, there's been lots of lovely comments, which I know James will go through. I found it funny to hear that people are uh, relating their man thoughts to what they see in some of their relationships with their partners and some of the yep. uh, attributes of that. Um, people have suggested things like using terms such as coaching instead of counselling. Yeah, I love it. Coaching is a great thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. People have spoken about the benefits of things like EMDR, um, yes. which is, yeah. I think, eye movement, desensitisation. And reprocessing. And, reprocessing. Sorry. and that, um, uh, the Phoenix Australia Guide will, not necessarily, it's not a training manual, but it will talk about those things like EMDR, cognitive processing therapy, other types of therapy. Uh, I like kind of schema rescripting type stuff as well. But, um, and that moves more into the specific. And if you want to go there, I kind of think to me, it's a logical step for most AOD clinicians. If you're going to be working in this space, we predominantly see like 64% of our clients are male. Um, most of them are kind of experienced often being kind of pushed into these things um, through cross-cutting across systems like family court and justice and all these things that have all sorts of layers of distress and associated with them. So they're not showing up necessarily happy to be here or necessarily in a, in a ready fit state to kind of go straight into talking about their emotions and feelings. So I really do think that um, because it is so prevalent and also for our women, I'm not kind of excluding that at all, that uh, it's almost like a logical step for somebody who's gonna be in this work for a long time. But then I aware there's other restrictions with that in terms of how long your service may work with people or you know, funding restrictions and stuff like that. But I think it's kind of uh, a logical step. 